Okay, so with typology, um, there's a lot of interesting takes and approaches people have towards typology, and they all have differing goals, right? One goal you can have in typology is to improve yourself, improve your thinking, improve your mind, improve how you approach things, improve your understanding of things. And that is a very valid approach that I think you need to start with to look at typology properly. Let's start between thinking and feeling. Typology is full of all these dichotomies you can have that are really meant to be and trying to be at the level of thinking. Now, many of the dichotomies are very good. You need really to have a dichotomy critic because some dichotomies are not so good. And you need more than one critic because a person cannot like a dichotomy because of a flaw in them in some way. I don't want to make the theory that any trauma ruins a person's ability to think, but I know how it goes. I described in my last video the lopsided dichotomies. Even Gulenko has a lopsided dichotomy I found. He's very big into typology and very professional, but it, it feels to me like maybe he had an ex-lover or a problem in his life with a person and he used typology to rationalize through that problem not understanding the whole picture, not realizing how maybe, in the other person's view, he could have been the problem in a legitimate way. People do this a lot with typology. And that's why I would say you kind of need dichotomy critics, in a sense, to, to criticize and really judge and look at these dichotomies. I'll be playing the role of a dichotomy critic here, a little bit. I'm just going to show you the most important dichotomies that I think are fundamentally at the level of thinking and they got there because people had evolved, developed feeling to a point where they realized what they were doing with their thinking, paradoxically enough. The dichotomies I wanna show you are introversion and extroversion, judging and perceiving, and then the third dichotomy differs by personality type because uh, sensing and thinking are both very concrete functions Intuition and feeling are both very abstract functions. So for the STs, anyone leading with a sensing and thinking function is their first two functions in whatever order. And the NFs, leading with intuition and feeling in whatever order, is their first two functions. That's the struggle and the dichotomy that matters. It's really amazing. I know ENFPs that I would talk to, they had to reframe ev any element I said that wasn't an abstraction. They had to make it an abstraction to verify. And not just verify, but reframe it towards what one might call their libido at the level of to be, as I would say. So like in being themselves, the way they frame it is the way they would see it in the world. And it becomes an abstraction with them every time. Then you have the STs and they simplify things into the concrete, looking at an actuality or a perceived actuality. This sounds simple. It actually can be very much a struggle. Uh, the NFs often can't be taken seriously. I knew an ST that was talking to an NF and the NF had to loop everything about the problem they were facing, an emotional problem they were facing around. Their advice came through data from the Starship Enterprise every time. And it drove the ST nuts. The ST left saying he's not data. Thinking, feeling disrespected, feeling at the level of to be like in this conversation, he's the one suffering, he's the one hurting, and he's not even allowed to see things as he sees them in the conversation. It's dehumanizing. The guy was hurt, and he has every right to be hurt by that moment. That NF wanted to help in an area that kind of was his wheelhouse and wasn't able to help because he had to make it all an abstraction and not just say what it was in the real world and his judgment in the real world of this thing. But frankly, when you do that to a person that's really concrete, it feels like you're trying to slip some judgment of them in that doesn't really belong there. And when they're a good person and did the right thing and your judgment is as if, is as if they did do the right thing and that's in something of the abstraction, ooh, you just lost... <laughs> the entirety. I even asked the NF afterwards if that's what he meant to do, and he realized and said, oh, you know, oh God, I didn't mean that. <laughs> and then he tried to apologize, doing it again in a different way. So 
So the NFs and the STs, the third dichotomy is between concrete and the abstract. What about the NTs and the SFs? This one's interesting and harder to see for people. I find that the NTs tend to have that proclivity, that gravitation towards making things universal. And the SFs have that thing towards making things contextual as opposed to universal. Now look at the NFs, right? They don't have to turn a spoon into an abstraction. They can say something's a spoon. It's a proclivity. It's a gravitation. When things matter, when there's skin in the game, stress on the line, and it really needs to be them solving it, they put their egos into the problem, and they have to make everything an abstraction that really matters. It's like that. So I know a lot of NTs I talk to, and when they really want to respect me, when they really want to care about me, they put their egos into the frame, and they take everything I say, and they reframe it as something more universal, a proclivity, a gravitation. They make it as universal as they can. It's not that they can't have any context, but they want to limit the context to go towards a very universal view, which can sometimes excise elements that are uncomfortable, but necessary to deal with. And in that regard, too, I've known some NTs. I knew an ENFJ that tried to help an NT with love. He told this person that if anyone gets closer than three feet to you, it probably means they like you. They like you. And then there was a girl that her contacts were dirty. She wore contacts normally. And she got really close to him because he was holding a book. But the thing is, she's squinting. She's doing it for the book. And he doesn't get the context because he's looking at it universally. If they're this close to me, that means they like me. And then he was hurt. Right? He, they don't do as well. The, the STs have a hard time sometimes with abstraction. And the NS have a hard time with making these concrete when it matters. Um, it's true. The, the NTs have a hard time with context. The SFs have a hard time with things being universal, and that might not make sense to you off the bat. So we have to look at the idea of information elements versus people. There are things in the world, informational areas and elements, that really should be universal, like science. Then you go into computer science. It's not quite the same thing, but it's kind of aiming towards universal, and it kind of should be, because we want something that will work for everybody, right? With science, you get the law of gravity. Now me, I'm an SF. I'm not going to question gravity, okay? I get it. It's not hard. But then you have things, and it's not because you might want to, if you are an NT and love the universal, you'll be like, oh, it's because he's kind of stupid. Oh, oh, no. You have rules in computer science that we call laws. Moore's Law. Is that a law at the level of gravity? No. But we state it like a law, we treat it like a law, and it might not be true. Now, I'm not going to remember Moore's Law off the top of my head, but it's the progress of computer chips will go at a certain speed. If they're limiting the speed to that amount, couldn't it go faster? But also, couldn't it go slower? Moore's Law doesn't talk about the requirements of Moore's Law, does it? And it just seems so arrogant. Like, what if there's a problem? A meteor hits the Earth at the right areas, and then Moore's Law won't hold true, will it? If it limits the speed, what if a person does some revolutionary breakthrough, and then we go way past Moore's Law? Hmm. I didn't do it to Moore's Law, but many... Discussions and algorithms had that audacity-filled trait of stating things you're not proving to be a law, like how gravity is, that you can't really tell why it's true by what they're saying, and it's a law, sort of, like the speed of an algorithm. It couldn't be faster, or could it? And I would get stuck in all those areas. Sometimes it was a little bit productive. Sometimes it did some good things here and there, but in general... In the realm of computer science, it wasted a lot of time. My flippant seeming curiosity 
which wasn't really flippant, but at the level of to be, I didn't want you to make these things so universal when they're kind of a contextual. If you all literally would just admit off the rip, this isn't really a law. To our knowledge, this is the limits of our knowledge in this area. We've tried a lot of things. It seems pretty firm, you know? If you would just have admitted that, I think, as a kid, I never realized this. It was a deeper level of self-knowledge than I had. I thought in my head, I'm going to help humanity by improving this. But if you just admitted with that humility, it's not really a law. I probably would have pursued different avenues that would have been a little bit more productive in my early days in computer science. I would have learned things faster, been better off, and so on and so forth. But you didn't. In your area where things are universal, you would not allow a contextual when there was really kind of, it was a contextual thing, really. And it did go the way you wanted it to go. And if I had the humility to treat it as a law, even though it wasn't really a law, I would have saved months. But egos are egos, and they do what they do. Then you go into areas, information element kind of areas, you think, that really should be contextual, situational things. And you get the NTs in those areas, then you get the other problem. So there, there's ideas like um, you shouldn't steal. Stealing is wrong. That's a universal. It's a moral, isn't it? And this is a problem with morals, is that in life there is context. It requires and needs and has to have the context, period. A universal idea without context is a farce. It's foolish and stupid and dumb and just don't do it. Stealing is wrong. Well, you might have an INTP say that. I've heard an INTP say that one time, and there's an ESFP in the room. What about Robin Hood, though? What about Robin Hood, though? Did you remember Robin Hood, though? Do you know about Robin Hood, though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He stole. It was good. What's, what's happening here? What is this really a war between universality and context? And in this case, even if the ESFP is a little bit over the top, they're kind of in the right. You need context for every, 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 every moral decision. You don't get to say the context doesn't matter because in some weird edge shot kind of a case, the context will matter. It will. We give a lot of morals that are true enough. But without context, you will have abuses that occur. We have a legal system with laws that are universal laws. If you cross the line, you'll get a punishment or a fine or something will happen to you. If people catch you crossing certain lines, right? That's our legal system based on universal things. But you know why it works? Because you have judges that at least to a fair enough degree will honor and acknowledge and realize the context of things. Without judges, we could not have a working legal system. You can't even really design one. And I'm, I know if you're an NT, you heard that. And just like with me in computer science, it's a challenge. <laughs> Well, technically, maybe you kind of could. No. Even if it seems like you could, you want it to be, you couldn't. You simply couldn't. It needs to be an acknowledged thing here between the contextual and the universal. Intuition and thinking want things to be universal. Sensing and feeling want things to be contextual. On the other side of the coin, sensing and thinking are concrete, intuition and feeling are abstract. These are the important dichotomies. That, introversion, extroversion, and then sensing, or sorry, judging and perceiving. Not sensing, I don't know why I said that. Sensing, the dichotomy. <laughs>
Well, I mean, there, but never mind that one. So those are the valid dichotomies that matter the most. The ones you need to actually have a good start towards typology to simplify it well. Let's talk about introversion and extroversion for a second. Jung made these into subjective and objective. Everyone follows Jung's lead on that one, maybe for the authority, for other reasons. But the thing is, many of them don't actually quite follow Jung. It's not that they don't do everything Jung did with subject and objective. It's that they added more a top that is them. I'm trying to show you in this a bare bones model of typology that you really need to add yourself into to make work. It's not enough by itself. The moment you touch it and use it, you will be adding the biases, the values, the thoughts, every element of you will come into play. The shape of you, the way you think, the variables you care about, the way you grab at those. All these little elements can occur when looking at how a person goes beyond this bare bones model when they're making a system in typology or using a system in typology. And from that, you'll know who they are. We've got the thinking universal element of the model, maybe intuitive too, and the sensing and maybe the feeling, sorry, the feeling, maybe the sensing model atop that, the element of the context of who are you using this system and I can know you as a person. What good is a dichotomy if there's not situations you can apply it to? What good is it? It would be worthless. But the true glory of the model is that it doesn't just apply to my situation or your situation or anything else. It applies to a ton of different ways of looking at it. So we'll see me through my way of doing this. I would want you to see any other person that's dealing in typology or making a system this way. And of course, it takes character and integrity and decency to do that in the proper way. If you realize you are judging other people unfairly, maybe look inwards and see if you can deal with that. But subjective and objective. Jung made it a little bit less full than most people make it. These words are like Swiss army knife words. You can configure them to get what you want. People configure them based on their libido, the level of to be that they need them to be a way to shape it, to make it the foundational for their system of typology. They all do that. I have seen people that love typology and made systems in typology debate each other. They debate each other's systems. These debates, in most cases, start with a person sneakily, sneakily. They're very good st strategists, essentially. They go, they start picking at your version, if you're the other person, of subjective and objective. Making you define these terms and figuring out how you could be wrong. In truth, the way I used to look at it, it's like you're looking at a tree from two different angles and you're taking photographs and you're saying, is this the tree? No, it's this. See your version of the tree, how it's over there and it looks like that angle? No, it's wrong. It's this angle of the tree. And they think they're smart. But what they're doing is they're trying to undermine the other person at the level of to be. The system you make in typology is you. It's a reflection of you. It's your thoughts. It's your being. It's your character. It's you, 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 you. At the level of to be, it's you. And when I question and try and make you wrong in your version of subjective and objective, I'm not proving it's scientific, factual, correct. It looks like I am because we haven't individuated enough to separate context from universality here. We haven't realized in my version of subjective and objective, I have context too. So if you question my version, you'll make my whole system insolvent. <laughs> it won't be comprehensible. It won't work. It'll be all wrong if you can redefine these words on me, just like me with you. They're at the level of to be. Like one person's really daring, another person's really safe. That's who they are at the level of to be. You can't change it. You can't demand it and blithely be like, oh, well, you should just be more daring and you should just be more safe. No, 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 no. You can say that and pretend that you're hitting a person in a way that involves feeling and pretending you're not doing that, which is malicious. That's malicious. You're literally denying them the essence of to be as a person. 
that's malicious. I'm sure at that moment, what I just said will be abused by people in the future wanting to do horrible things. But when you have healthy feeling and you get it, you'll get it. They go into screaming matches. I have seen three hour long debates about systems and typology. They started with define subjective and objective. They ended in screaming three hours later. They never left the topic. It's not some light, blithe, fun, oh, there's Sega Genesis and Nintendo kind of a mindset. No, 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 no. This is literally attacking a human being at the core of the essence of their being. When you try to deny them their definition of subjective and objective in a case like typology. In a case where they put in the work around the word and they built the system around the word. I know in the thinking landscape, it should be a simple shift, a simple shift. You are literally asking a person to shift when they put in the work around it like that, their entire personality into being your personality. And you don't realize you're doing it because you don't really know the difference between thinking and feeling universal contextual. You're not looking at your own context enough to realize the footprint you had to have. It would be like, I'm eating food, but what if you don't need food? <laughs> it's like that level. You only realize it if you've grown to realize it. What do these words really mean? The bare bones version of subjective is that it has opinions. It's an opinionated function. All the introverted functions in a person will be opinionated. The extroverted functions will basically be devoid of opinion and not want opinion. The way they're structured in the person, they have to hold on to objective things. So if you have an opinion, you show them that they can accept at a level. They oftentimes treat it, if they're using that function that's objective to touch upon it, as if it were fact. They're not very good at delving and playing in the world of opinion. It's weird, but it's true. And so that's the bare bones model of it. That's what it is. I knew two friends of mine. I was at an INTP's house and INTJ was there too. Their internet went out. The INTP's internet went out. TI. He was using TI. That's his essence of to be. He needs to do this. This is who he is. This is his personality. You can't change it. You can't. He starts theorizing on why the internet went out. And he's worried about it. What if it was Russian hackers? That's his first theory. First. The INTJ does not accept theories. Cannot handle or have or exist in the world of theories unless they're very useful towards what the INTJ wants. And the INTJ wants to play more video games on the internet and not talk about how Russian hackers have destroyed the internet here. And he tells this INTP a very astute observation. You have a modem, and if you unplug the modem and you wait 30 seconds, and then you plug it back in, it will reset. This usually restores the internet. But this quashes the INTP at the level of to be. I wanted to make a theory and talk through my theory. I wanted my theory to be proven right or wrong or accepted. If you can't prove it's wrong, you should accept that it's possible Russian hackers did this, he says in his mind. He didn't say it publicly. And so he makes a new theory. Did you order anything from a website while you were here? They might have backtraced it. <laughs> he said backtraced it. They might have backtraced it. That was his second theory. To which the INTJ responded, unable to accept these opinionated theories because they're not conducive to playing video games. You have a router. It's like a modem router thing. It might be a hybrid combo. And you can unplug that. And then you can wait 30 seconds. 
with no power going to whatever the router and the modem are, the modem is, you can unplug both if they're separate. And then you wait 30 seconds, you plug them back in. If they're separate, you should plug back in the router first and then the modem. And that will restore the internet connectivity to your house in most cases. But again, this is the INTJ's libido. His TE is objective. You can't prove these things, so shut up. There's video games. I was playing them with you. That's what he's really saying. And the INTP can't have it. He needs to be allowed to have the theories. So he says, finally, it's this is compromise from Russian hackers to back tracing to this. The ISP, Internet Service Provider in his area, made a new tier of service. And they're probably, they're probably disrupting the service on the other tiers to lower their quality to force you into the newer tier. He gave up so much in the room of making theories. No more Russian hackers, no more backtracing hacking because you bought something from Amazon. None of that. None of it. Just a simple thing about the possibility of that the ISP might have some greedy in them, which everybody can generally agree with. But no. By this point, the INTJ, libido-wise, was checked out with the leniency. And he said the most cutting words you could imagine from an INTJ in this situation. You have a modem, and if you unplug the modem, and you wait 30 seconds, and you plug it back in, it will reset the modem. In most cases, this will restore the internet. If that doesn't work, you can call your ISP to ask what the problem is. Do you see what he's done here? This sounds so mundane. He just denied the INTP the ability to suspect his ISP because he's forcing in his idea pure trust. When you call them, you should listen to what they say because they're the authority source that will tell you why the internet went out. And if you trust them, that is the best chance you have, if I'm being fair, to getting a better quality service. And it is. The INTJ in that regard is right. Just trust your ISP. Talk with them like human beings. Maybe there's a problem, technically. Maybe it's the kind of modem you have or something else will come up. And maybe not. I don't know. But you're really not going to get anywhere by suspecting them of fraudulently destroying your service to, to herd you into some higher tier. You know, it's like a Seinfeld episode at that point. It really is. But the INTP at the level of to be needs to be able to say, no, they might be doing a game, playing a game on me. They might be ruining the service. They, they need to have that allowed in the world. And the INTJ needs that not to be allowed in the world. No subjective opinions, please. Let's just live life by the rules we're given. In this moment, later on, the INTJ alluded to the INTP's suspicions being a form of narcissism. Yeah, it was a form of narcissism somehow. <laughs> to just suspect the ISP of that. Lowered from suspecting Russia and the backtracings, you know. <laughs> it's narcissism, they say. And I think to myself, um, why is it narcissism? This is the ego of the INTJ. Their libido denying the ability to have an opinion. They take the character of the opinion and they characterize you by the opinion. And they make you a hateful person. When the INTP really isn't a hateful person. They're just suspicious of things in that way. You know? At one point between these two, the INTP had an argument. And the INTJ, it was a fair argument for the INTP to have, in my opinion. But I'm, I have TI. Um, the INTJ made the point that you should never attribute to malice what you contribute to incompetence. But he made it 
at such a point that denies the context <laughs> that I see. And it's like, so if you're around two people and you turn your head for five seconds and then one of them is stabbed and, and gone, you know, not with us anymore. <laughs> the other one's standing there whistling like you didn't do it. Was it just like an incompetent thing? You know, like why investigate murders? They were incompetent against being stabbed, you know? Like, why look at these things? Hmm. Maybe a lot of times we call somebody else a narcissist. It's because we were infringed upon at the level of to be by them just existing as themselves. I'm sure if the INTP wanted to, by that same circumstance, they could call the INTJ a little bit narcissistic. You know, and that word, of course, is out of the DSM. I'm not a licensed psychologist. I'm not saying they're psychologically narcissists. It's the way we use the word. It's the way we use the word that we do this all the time. So that's subjective and objective. You see how much I put on top of that to describe it to you? And you could put other things on top of it and make it something totally different. Thinking, universal. Subjective is opinionated. Objective repels opinion, basically, and does not want to be opinionated ever. Feeling contextual? Look how big. <laughs> the whole thing with the INTP and the INTJ, that's my circumstance that I've been through to, to flesh out what this means from my perspective situationally. And if I had a million more of those... Every one of them, if they're designed right and not just repeats, would help you have a deeper understanding of what subjective and objective mean. But thinkers, what they do when they don't want to have feeling is they go, well, I knew what that meant. See that one in the umbrella? That's what it meant. But it doesn't give you that depth. You need to use feeling with thinking in the right way to make the right depth of knowledge to really get something. This is the foible of many thinkers in typology. They convince themselves they're smart without actually trying to go for the gold. Now, the next thing is perceiving and judging. The last of these dichotomies to give you today. I know it's been a long video. <laughs> this is one of those where there's a lot of ways people skew it. And I need to show it to you in a way where you can see the skew. So, with judging, all I can say is there's a space in your head with things in it. In some people's views, it's only of perceptions, and you judge perceptions. In other people's views, it's of judgments and perceptions. Or just maybe judgments, oddly enough, in, in one odd view I found that I don't really understand. But it, it was a person's view. And you judge the things in that scope. You're judging things in like a, an area that is in your mind. What is that area, you might ask? You already want it to be something, don't you? You've already decided what it is. That's you. That's how you see the world. Is it your conscious mind? Is it bigger than your conscious mind? The subsection of your conscious mind? What is it? It's something. And in that area, you're making decisions about the subject matter in the area. And those decisions are judgments. I've heard one person, basically, they didn't use this verbiage, but there was like a, a way that they would judge what to judge. They would, they would decide the scope of the area, which is why I'm saying there's just some area. They would decide not to judge certain things and to judge other things in a very primal level for them. That wasn't a thing they were deciding to do too um, consciously, but they were doing it. And then you have, of course, perceiving. What is perceiving? There's a scope, an area in your mind where you perceive things into existence in your mind. You perceive something. Now, just as you can judge a perception, 
do you think you can't perceive a judgment? It depends on who you are, how your brain works, and then I have a little bit of trust in people, right? I think the way they define things is how they understand their own brains to work based on their personalities. It shows about their personality. So what's a few things we see of bias done to this basic bare bones psychotomy to make it work at all? Because you have to change it to make it work, don't you? You have to build upon it, and then that's you. The first thing is lopsided dichotomies. I've known T.I. Doms that literally make it so you need thinking and judging, but really it's thinking in their case, for everything. They make it the go-between for all perception. You can't even know that a baseball is a baseball to say it's a baseball without thinking. You can't do anything without thinking. So they make thinking literally the requirement for life, practically. Then I knew an ENFP, <laughs> a very opposite kind of a person of the first person. They perceived ideas into being. They, they gained a perception of a way to do something. They, the, the way they thought they used thinking and judging was in the conveyance of their idea to get another person to understand. But if they were alone and they had a new way to do something, it was intuition. Extroverted intuition just brought the idea into their head. They perceived the idea and acted upon their perception. The way they describe it, no judgment is done. All perceiving. Because they tend to favor perceiving to judging. The way they experience the world and live in the world may be very different from the person who said it the other way. They could be the same too. I don't know, but I, I really like to presume they're different because of the way they have that difference in understanding and the bias they give to things. In this case, the lopsided dichotomy to me is not indicative of a personal problem, but indicative of the self. So lopsided dichotomies can often be very important for many reasons. Um, hmm. What else about that? There was a person I knew who was an ENFJ, and he had this riddle that would try to teach NI to people. It was of a parking lot, basically. And the point of it, secretly, untold to you, they had cars parked so you couldn't see the numbers in some spots, and it was a riddle. It was a riddle of what the missing numbers would be. But it was upside down. So people that didn't use perception would do it wrong. They would try and find a mathematical formula between the pattern of this number, that number, that number, that number, and what would be the number in between numbers three and four. And they'd be doing all this hard work racking their brains. And it's just literally flipped the picture upside down. What would you call that? I said the introverted functions are opinionated, didn't I? This is an opinionated perspective. You are able to have an NI opinion about the perspective you're looking at. And you realize, I'm looking at it all wrong. Boom, flip it around. Done. The rest of the problem, the thinking element of this problem that was taking college graduates like 10 minutes before they gave up in some cases, a third grader could do. At least when I was in third grade, a third grader could do it. Because you, he's teaching the value of himself. He's teaching the value of the NI, subjective, opinionated, perceiving function. How is SI opinionated? It might see that too, I suppose. The general stereotype of SI that I, I can't really disagree with, you look at a cloud, you see Yoshi, you know? That's an opinion of perspective. I look at things, um, the idea of a tastemaker, so to say, in a sense. I saw a, a new movie with Timothy Chalamet as Willy Wonka. I saw 10 minutes of that. And I realized immediately that Michael Sarah would have been much better than Timothy Chalamet. I think that's very SI-based to know that in that way, that opinion. 
It is an opinion. We talk about NI knowing. We frame it as knowing. NI knowing their opinion of how to perceive it. And with the riddle, it's very correct. <laughs> there are some areas NI can be very wrong in their opinion. All subjective functions, all introverted functions can make mistakes in that way. They can't. And of course, if you have an introverted function, you don't really have strong or any, let's say, access to the opposing extroverted function. Introverted thinkers don't really go into extroverted thinking, depending on the system. Some systems say they do, some say they don't. But it's, it's kind of hard. Even if they do, you want to argue that they're very good at extroverted thinking. Well, they're better at introverted thinking. And the problem that defines their life in that case will still be that they don't want to turn back to extroverted thinking when they've gotten their way at some point. So maybe in your mind you think they climb a big mountain of going back and forth between introverted and extroverted thinking, and they end on introverted thinking, and they don't want to go back to extroverted thinking. They can't do it anymore, <laughs> and they think they're right. They've worn themselves out, let's say. Whatever the case might be in your mind, between whether or not they have eight functions, four functions, whatever you want to think. My personal opinion, I think it's a little bit complicated, but I think we only consciously have the four. And the other four are actually unconscious to us. You'll notice everyone agrees to call it the unconscious mind, but they act like they have a conscious grasp of it, which is a lot of emulation in my mind and playing around with that. Um, it's interesting how that plays out. It really is. Just keep in mind, though, there's an objective world we live in, and we're all theorizing on how much grasp and access we have to these functions based on an objective world. But it's theories and not proofs. So, if I were to go to an eight-function believer and argue my point to them, and they wanted to argue their point, it's possible we'd just be talking past each other forever, because they wouldn't want to see what I see, as I described in my first video on this channel. But anyways, though, that is introverted, sorry, that is perception and judgment. And afterwards, of course, I talked about the way that a perception can have an opinion. They do. They're not judgments. They're opinions of perception, which is very interesting. Um, in the modern world, of course, you can get confused. Like, why would I say Michael Sarah would be better? I'd have to give you judgment kind of views, areas he'd do better, or i judge him to do better to explain my perception to you. But you could just see it and get it. You know, that's my ego, wanting you to be like me. We all want the other to be like us. I would want you to just understand, just the idea would hit your brain, and you do the processing like I didn't go, oh my god, he's right. <laughs> How could they miss this? <laughs> you know? But maybe you won't. It's an opinion. Being a person that has studied typology, of course, I realize it's an opinion. And I realize you could not have it, which would be sad. But you could also have it, which would be joyful. Those are the important dichotomies. Introversion, extroversion, judging, perceiving, and then the split between the STs and the NFs of things being concrete or abstract, and the SFs or the NTs, where things are either contextual or universal. I hope this helps you to see typology, scrape all the excess off the top from those layers, and see who a person that made a system is. And it's, I don't think they were ever trying to be this naked, beautiful view of a human being in this sense, exposing every element of who they are in terms of personality and cognitive functions, the ones that made systems. They were probably just trying to change the world and do some big change, usually with more ego in it, more want of you to be like them than they realized, you know? Maybe they didn't realize, like, I would, as a younger me, that someone might not agree with Michael Sarah as, you know, Willy Wonka. They wouldn't see the other sides of things, and they were just trying to put themselves into the world. It's a, a youthful, blissful ignorance. But it's still wonderful. I'm still glad they tried to make those systems. I'm still glad they did make those systems and what it does. Um, I always used to worry about 
if any of these systems took over, it would make a world like how a, a family has that cognitive atmosphere where one kid gets left out. It would make an atmosphere of a world that so strongly is in favor of certain types and so strongly against other types. It would hurt people. But I think maybe that's just me worrying too much. I'm glad we've done the exploration. I'm glad we've put in the effort. I'm glad to have seen and understood what I've seen and understand of people. Thank you for your time, and good afternoon.